Okay, here we go. Lesson five, the Nazi party, its origin, ideas, and early development. Let's move on and look at the key questions. There are three key questions which you'll need to be able to discuss and debate and ask questions about. Uh, the first of them, what developments took place within the Nazi party in its earliest years? Uh, the second one, what was the agenda and beliefs of the Nazis? What did the Nazis stand for? And the last one, how was the party reorganised after the failure of the Munich Putsch? Um, you do need to learn some chronology as well. Uh, yes, of course, history is about understanding, debates about ideas, interpretations, but you do need to learn a bit of basic chronology, the sequence of events. So let's have a quick look at those. Uh, 1920 was the foundation of the Nazi party. In fact, really, it's kind of incorrect to call them the Nazis. That's how they were referred to by their enemies. Uh, the actual uh, correct name is the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or you could just National Socialists for, for, for short. Although I will continue to refer them, to them as the Nazis because it basically is briefer. Uh, so in 1920, there was also the publication of the agenda, the beliefs of the Nazis, in their 25 point program. Uh, in 1923, the, the Beer Hall Putsch in Munich. Uh, in 1924, the treason trial of Hitler. Uh, 1925, which saw the publication of Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler's book, which proved to be quite a hit within Germany. Uh, 1926 was the Bamberg Conference, when Hitler reasserted his control over the Nazi party, and there's a significant amount of reorganisation. And 1929, the anti-Young campaign, when Hitler and the Nazis were invited to join Alfred Hugenberg's campaign against the Young Plan, which resulted in quite a lot of exposure for the Nazis. So let's have a look at the earliest developments in the Nazi party. Well, in 1920, its most famous member, Adolf Hitler, joined. At the time, it was called the German Workers' Party. Um, it was really more of a debating society. They, they debated uh, various things in, in beer halls uh, throughout Munich. Well, a lot of reorganisation, uh, of rationalisation of the Nazis' agenda came about when Hitler became the leader of the NSDAP in 1920. The, as we said, the 25-point programme of the Nazi party was established, uh, outlining the major beliefs. They were renamed the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Interestingly, you can see already how that the strategy of trying to get votes from both the left wing and the right wing, with the national... Uh, appealing to the right wing with the nationalists and the socialists appearing to the left wing, the, the German workers. Um, moving on, uh, a bit uh, more reorganisation. They also got their own newspaper, so similar to other groups throughout Germany, like the, 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 um, the Social Democrats and other, the, the Catholics, other groups, they, they had their own uh, newspaper, the Volkische Berbachter. I'm sorry to any people who can speak German, I probably mangled the pronunciation of that. Um, and they opened a system of local party branches. So efforts at reorganising them and making them into a, into a political force, a real political force. Party rallies began around that time as well, show, shows of strength and organisation. Uh, in 1921, the SA were established, SA being short for Stumabtelung, which means stormtroopers, also called brown shirts because of this distinctive colour of the uniforms that they wore which uh, I think they were actually brown because they ordered a lot of spare uniforms from the Austrian Postal Service. It wasn't a stylistic choice. 1922, the SA, the Stormtroopers, number 6,000. But by November 1923, the time of the Munich Putsch, they're number 50,000. So there is a fair amount of support for the Nazis in their early years, particularly um, in Bavaria and Munich. Well, what did the Nazis stand for? Well, Hitler himself was not a systematic... A logical, worked-out thinker, and neither was really the agenda of the Nazis. He wasn't original either. I mean, we tend to think of hateful anti-Semitism and the other you know, really revolting aspects of Nazi ideology as belonging to Hitler, but really he took an existing brew of ideas and mixed them together in the Nazi ideology. So anti-Semitism, uh, racism against Jewish people, wasn't new. Neither was his desire for authoritarianism and expansion of Germany. So, you know, hardly original. And not intellectual, not sort of worked out. In fact, Hitler despised intellectuals. Uh, he was much more instinctual in his thinking. What was he, though? He was certainly an agitator. He wanted to stir things up. 
uh, cause problems and then exploit the, the, the chaos that that caused. He was a propagandist. He sought to stir the thinking, the minds, the opinions of the German people. And he was definitely a man of action. Again, this is sort of in opposition to intellectualism and theory. He believed more in direct action. The Nazis really, it was a bundle of instincts. <laughs> Sorry again, not instincts. It was a bundle of instincts, hatreds and prejudices. It was a Often it's been called um, a bringing together of, of, of the disenfranchised, of hatreds. Um, it was, what did it sort of stand for? It, again, it's more of what it's against than what it stands for. But the things it sort of stood for were ultra-nationalism, racism, authoritarianism, anti-communism, and perhaps surprisingly, because these four, the ultra-nationalism, the racism, the authoritarianism, and the anti-communism, he would share these with other right-wing groups, but one which perhaps he wouldn't share with other right-wing groups was anti-capitalism, but we'll explore more of that in a moment. What do we mean by ultra-nationalism? Well, nationalism is one of those uh, beliefs on the right-wing end of the political spectrum. Uh, particularly, rather than sort of international cooperation, um, nas ultra-nationalism is kind of a perversion of Darwin's idea of struggle between species over resources and it sees that being reflected in struggle between nations so it's kind of a zero-sum game of winners and losers and ultra-nationalism wants obviously Germany to be a winner in that regard um, it looks towards German greatness, towards a mythical German greatness of the past they want to regain territory lost in the Treaty of Versailles into a greater Germany to reunite the German-speaking peoples, you know, those that were lost in the Polish corridor, those German minorities that lived in Czechoslovakia. They also wanted to expand into the East, to sort of create a German empire, of a sort of German knightly class lording it over Slavic peasants in the East. So they wanted to take land from Poland and from the Soviet Union, take the land resources and use those. It was obviously extremely racist. Again, race, they kind of confused race and nationality. In fact, race has no biological basis whatsoever, but they sort of conflated the two ideas of race and nationality. They saw themselves as Nordic Aryans, uh, as being a superior race, and they, they looked at people, of, for example, from Eastern Europe, Russians and Poles, as subhuman Slavs. A another group that they hated were the Jews, Again, they believed in really patently ridiculous uh, theories lacking in any evidence whatsoever. Uh, they believed that the Jews were bent on world domination secretly behind the lines. All of these conspiracy theories are <laughs> absolutely conspiracy theories are the refuge of the feeble-minded. Uh, let's move on. Authoritarianism was another belief of the Nazi party. They believed that in order for Germany to be successful in this struggle of nations, it needed an all-powerful leader who could direct the resources and the people of Germany. They saw democracy as conflict within the nation that would compromise the strength of the nation, so they were anti-democratic. They saw that as being against national unity and revival these many sectional parties, for example, within Germany. In fact, this is a direct quote from Hitler. The broad masses are blind and stupid. He didn't trust them to choose their own destiny. They should follow the leader. Surprisingly, actually, he actually said that in a rally, but it didn't dent his popularity. The other thing, anti-capitalism. Now, this is something which is a bit more difficult, really, because they're kind of anti-capitalist and they're kind of not. Some elements within the Nazi party, particularly in northern Germany, were hostile to big business. They did also see a Jewish influence there um, in big business, uh, and uh, so obviously they were anti-Semitic, and they saw that as being connected with international finance. And if you do remember that, you know, it's the Wall Street crash in America that brings the world economy down. So they see this system of international finance, again, these half-baked, ridiculous conspiracy theories of Jewish influence in international finance. So as, as a result of that, there's some hostility towards international finance and what they see as a Jewish influence on business. So they do... Uh, they are in favour of, to an extent, a state-directed economy. But by no means are they in favour of a state-directed economy along Soviet lines. They do still believe in private enterprise, private property and business. 
So what they do see is they, they see some of them, especially they see small businesses and traders of the middle class. The middle class would provide a lot of support for the Nazis in future. They see them as being squeezed between big business. For example, the new department stores they see as squeezing out small traders. Um, and they see them being squeezed between them and between the, them and the trade unions. OK, let's move on. Anti-communism is something that we're more familiar with. Um, Bizarrely, um, Hitler sees that Jew the Jews being behind both communism and capitalism, which are kind of is a contradiction, and he calls it Jewish Marxism. It's believed it's some part, part of some <laughs> sinister plot to take over the world. And he makes the distinction, our adopted term socialism has nothing to do with Marxist socialism. A distinction, for example, he says Marxism is anti-property, true socialism is not. So there are limits to their um, anti-capitalism. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's move on. So how did then the Nazi beliefs differ from those of the traditional conservative elites? Well, the conservative elites uh, wanted a restoration of the monarchy, whereas the Nazis wanted a man chosen by destiny, which Hitler increasingly saw as himself after the events of 1923. The right-wing elite wanted to restore the foreign colonies of Germany that were taken away under the Treaty of Versailles, given as mandates to particularly Britain and France, Whereas the Nazis weren't particularly interested in regaining foreign colonies. They were more interested in carving out a, a European German empire. They wanted Lebensraum in Eastern Europe. Whereas the, uh, the conservative elites were definitely in favour of big business and capitalism, at least on the surface, and perhaps more in an attempt to get the votes of the working class, but some, some elements within the Nazis were anti-capitalist to an extent. The uh, traditional uh, right wing, the traditional conservatives, uh, were keen on preserving class differences and status, uh, whereas the Nazis pursued something called Volksgemeinschaft, a sort of national community where people would work together for the good of the nation. Okay, let's go on and look at Hitler's treason trial, which occurred in 1924. So in, no in November of 1923, the Beer Hall Putsch was unsuccessful. Uh, von, Ka von Kahr, of course, didn't support the Nazis and, uh, and, and used the police to, to prevent it. 80 people were killed, including 16 Nazis, or different numbers depending on the sources you read. So between February and March of 1924, uh, the treason trial of Hitler happens. There is actually a sympathetic judge. Uh, many elements, if you remember that the, you know, the judiciary, the police and so on, they are quite right-wing. Well, in fact, they're often very right-wing, some of them. They're conservative, right-wing and so on. And so that he's sympathetic to a lot of the messages that Hitler propounds in the courtroom. And in fact, Hitler is not as courageous as he seems in using the courtroom as a forum for speeches, um, as he's actually been acquitted uh, by the same judge previously uh, in 1920. So he knows already that the judge is sympathetic to him. So he's sentenced to five years, which is actually a laughably low amount of time served for a treasonous attempt to overthrow the government which results in people being killed. Five years is a ridiculously small sentence and evidence of you know, a sympathetic judge. It's during that time that Hitler writes Mein Kampf and he's actually released after only six months in December of 1924 and it affords the Hitler and the Nazis a lot of national publicity. Um, his trial is covered throughout uh, Germany, not just in Bavaria, but throughout Germany. It's also a bit of a turning point for Hitler himself, as he starts being seeing himself as that man chosen by destiny that will save Germany. He sees himself as Germany's saviour. After the Munich Putsch, the, the National Socialists were, in, were kind of in disarray. Uh, there was division, disunity. In fact, the party had been banned, although the ban was lifted in 1925. There was something of a split between the North uh, German branch of the party and the branch down in Munich. In fact, the North Germans, uh, under Gregor Strasser, were quite anti-capitalist. They were certainly the more socialist uh, wing of the German party. Well, in the Bamberg Conference of 1926, Hitler does something he kind of does quite a lot. He rants and raves and does a long two-hour speech in which he says, you know, there's going to be no changes to Nazi policy. We are not drifting towards the left. We are not becoming more anti-capitalist. We're, we're sticking with our 25-point policy. And Gregor Strasser agrees to that. Hitler really does stamp his authority over the party. He reorganises it under the Führer principle, the leadership principle, that he is the absolute dictator. He is the leader. He is the 
the, 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 uh, totally at the top, the dominating leader of the party. And it's in 1926 that the Heil Hitler salute is established, which becomes a greeting between Nazi party members. So a new political strategy is adopted by the Nazi party, and that is the policy of legality. Well, what does this mean, and what doesn't it mean? What it does mean is that they're now going to contest elections as a legitimate political party. They're no, they're no longer going to try and seize power, as they tried to do in the, in the Munich Putsch, through, through a violent coup d'etat. They're going to contest elections and use the base in the Reichstag uh, to try and undermine democracy from within. What this doesn't mean, they are, no, they are not believers in parliamentary democracy. Hitler despises democracy, you know, he sees it as sectional politics against the, the, a unified Germany which he believes is necessary for Germany to rise to greatness. So they're not fans of parliamentary democracy, but they're seeking to get members into parliament through a legal strategy and, as we say, undermine it from within. And although they sort of renounce violence on the surface, and there is a separation, theoretically, between the SA and the Nazi party, in actuality, violence is a political strategy of the Nazis. For example, the SA frequently attack the communist para paramilitary groups, the Red Front Fighters League. Um, so, why do they do that? They do that in order to weaken law and order, to create chaos, and to show themselves to a disgruntled electorate, especially the middle class who fear uh, the communists, show themselves as the only alternative to restore law and order within Germany. It's calculated violence. It's violence which is, as I say, it, it has its part of the political strategy to create chaos and to show themselves as the only ones capable of restoring order and ending a communist threat. But as, so we have a two-pronged strategy both the calculated violence and attempting to engage through propaganda and so on in the electoral process. Um, let's look now at the reorganization of the National Socialist Party, which also occurs um, you know, after 1926 and the Bamberg Conference. So we've got the division of Germany now into 35 GAU, which kind of roughly correspond to, to the districts of Germany. And each GAU will be led by a Gauleiter. So it's really a national strategy to try and get votes across Germany, to move out from their base of support in Bavaria and to a more limited extent in northern Germany, and to try and get support across Germany in these 35 Gau and the Gauleiter. Hitler, of course, under the Führer principle, the leadership principle, is the absolute dictator within this system. He's at the top of the system. Uh, a very significant Gauleiter is Josef Goebbels, who becomes the Gauleiter of the Gau of Berlin. So I hope you've made some uh, good notes there, and uh, see you in the lesson.